behalf of the SCH community and our parent association and our students who are the most important part of our school, we, we really thank you for giving up some time. Um, I think you're a little busy currently um, in, in DC, but I think hopefully, uh, you know, my job is a lot less stressful than yours, but even when I'm having a bad day, I just, when it, I go out and walk through the school, I go talk to the kids and immediately um, life gets better. And, you know, so hopefully an evening with some, with some in a school environment will be a, be a highlight for you. So on behalf of SCH, on behalf of our community, I really wanna thank you for joining us. I wanna thank uh, Will Dunbar for making this happen. And I'm gonna turn it over to Will for a little more formal introduction. Well, hold on, but how do I how do I address you? You're like the grand poobah of the whole school, and I don't know. Like, I, I feel like I need to give you a, a like the proper title of honor. Uh, <laughs> I'm so grateful you would invite me to your community. So thank you, and I'm sorry to to, to, to Will. I'm sorry to jump on you all like that, but I just I I, no. get nervous. I still am nervous when I'm ahead in front of you know I'm at a I'm at a K through twelve, but I still see a man like this of authority and I think he might put me in detention or something. We can arrange a cafeteria duty for you, Senator. Uh, anytime. It's, it's right, right. <laughs> I, tell him you, I tell him you were familiar with Chestnut Hill, so we would definitely have some great vegan options for you as well there. <laughs> so, um, so without further ado, I, we're already live and going. So I will just give a quick intro. Of, uh, I'm obviously proud to welcome our friend and big brother, Senator Cory Booker, to our community here at SEH. Uh, Cory is a U.S. Senator from New Jersey who has been serving since 2013. Cory is the first African-American U.S. Senator from New Jersey who previously served as the 38th mayor of Newark. Uh, Cory, Cory believes that Amer the American dream isn't real for anyone unless it is within reach of everyone. Corey has dedicated his life to fighting for those who have been left out, left behind, or left without a voice. Corey has brought an uh, innovative uh, consensus building approach to tackling some of the most difficult problems faced in our country. He has emerged as a national leader in the effort to fix our broken criminal justice system and end mass incarceration. Corey has also been a leader in the Senate in the fight to protect the Affor Affordable Care Act. And most recently, Senator Booker B became the first vegan senator to be appointed to the Senate Agricultural Committee. Um, so, so we have a lot of plant-based uh, parents here and students that are really happy about that. So without further ado, we welcome you to the Blue Devils Nation, Senator Booker. Uh, I, I am, first of all, Brother Dunbar, thank you very much for that. I an overly generous introduction. Thank you for this invitation. I am so excited. I have this crazy day so far, and I've still got negotiations to come tonight uh, on everything from policing reform uh, to dealing with uh, child poverty and some big push we're doing with the White House to try to cut child poverty in half. But this was like a shining light on my schedule today to get a chance to share with a community of young people who are from this great school that are going to be leaders, that are going to be making history, making American history, and many of you uh, making and or affirming uh, uh, African-American history. And so I just wanna talk to you all from the heart about why black history is so important. Now I tell you, I had these parents that raised me with history all around me from pictures and art to books. My mom read me everything probably from Alex Haley to, uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, people like Carter G. Woodson and others telling me uh, stories uh, from our history and why it was so important for me as a young black boy to know my history as an African-American, but our history uh, as Americans and to honor the, all the different uh, threads and, 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 and cords that weave together to create the fabric of our country. But my parents didn't want me just to know black history because it's important, obviously. They wanted me to understand the great contributions of African-Americans to this country. But they wanted black history, the study of it, the knowledge of it, to activate me into being a person committed to this country and to the call and to the cause of this country. And my hope is no matter what your ethnic background is, 
that this month of looking back and seeing history, that you are affected in the present to be more committed to the cause of this country. Because if anything we know about Black history is that there are all of these Americans of African descent who were not enjoying this country, but were dying from it. From Crispus Attucks, the first person to die in the fight for this country during the revolutionary era, to every major war in this nation where Blacks have served in dis with distinction and courage and honor, to Blacks that have died in massacres in this nation, thousands of African Americans lynched, towns burned and bombed, like we saw in Oklahoma in Black Wall Street, to Black inventors, to literally hidden figures who joined together with white astronauts to defy gravity and take humanity to higher heights. My hope for you in our conversation tonight is that you recognize that Black history isn't for Black people. Black history is for all of us to inspire us to move forward. Now, to give you a little Black history as America's fourth ever Black person elected, popularly elected the United States Senate. Before me, it was a guy named Barack Obama. Before that, it was a woman named Carol Mosley Braun. And the first elected African-American to the United States Senate uh, was a man named uh, Edmund Brooke. Uh, I learned very quickly when I was sworn in by Joe Biden, he was a vice president then to Barack Obama, swore me in as a senator. Uh, before that, I went to go visit a man named John Lewis. Now, John Lewis is this titan, this hero, this giant of a man, even though I was much taller than him in reality. I looked up to the guy. He was one of the five people that spoke at the March on Washington. And you all know the March on Washington because it was the time that Martin Luther King stood up and said, I have a dream. Well, that March on Washington, one of the greatest demonstrations for civil rights, John Lewis was just in his 20s when he spoke there. He was a young guy. And he was considered one of the bravest people in the civil rights movement because on multiple occasions in sit-ins and freedom rides, he was beaten viciously as he tried in nonviolent protest to move this country more towards justice, equality, civil rights, and voting rights. Well, when I went to see John Lewis, I didn't know something about him. I mean, I knew some of his most heroic ever stands, but I didn't know how he affected my life. I was about to be sworn in as a United States Senator by the Vice President of the United States, who's now the President of the United States. And I go see John Lewis and he has like, his eyes are watering up telling me how thankful he is as a congressperson to see this young guy getting sworn in as a senator and all the struggles, his, his, his office looked like a civil rights museum, except for he was in all the pictures. And, and, and what I didn't know at that point was how he affected my life. And that's the story I wanna tell you. You see, on March 7th, 1965, there was a march for voting rights in Alabama. A group of activists led by John Lewis were going to march to Montgomery, Alabama from Selma to march for voting rights. And when they got on this bridge on that day, the Alabama state troopers stopped them and John Lewis told me that they saw the state troopers, they were not going to let them pass until they decided amongst themselves to kneel and pray. But as they went to go kneel, those Alabama state troopers shot tear gas at them and then stormed into them, some of them on horseback with billy clubs wildly swinging at the marchers. John Lewis was hit in the head knocked unconscious, cut open, bleeding that, that bridge red. He had to be carried back to a church where the marchers scrambled for safety. 
it was such a vicious day that, that they call that day now Bloody Sunday. Now, this is a moment in Black history that had always captivated me because of the courage and the savagery, because of the nonviolence in the face of violence. I had known about it all my life. But you see, I became a senator and I did something that many senators who have a high sense of self-regard decide to do. I, I decided to write a book. And if your name is Booker, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big tale. You got, you got a lot of expectations there for crying out loud. And so when I went to go write my book, I, I wanted to write about stories from my life. And one of the stories from my life is that in 1969, my family moved here to New Jersey from the South. And when they tried to move into neighborhoods in New Jersey that were white, that had great public schools, my parents were turned away and told that, they, they, that the house was sold. They knew they were being lied to. They were, oh, this house has been taken off the market. They knew they were being lied to. And they found this group of activists, black and white, Christian and Jewish, who decided that they were going to try to break open this, this, this segregation. And then what they did is they would send my parents to look at a house. They would be told the house was sold. They would send a white couple behind them. And inevitably, the white couple would find out the house was still for sale. And so the house I would grow up in, my parents were told it was sold. The white couple came and found out the house was still for sale. They put a bid on the house. The bid was accepted. Papers were drawn up. And on the day of the closing, the white couple didn't show up. My dad did and a volunteer lawyer. And they walk into the real estate agent's office and, and they confront the real estate agent who realizes he's been caught in his lie and his discrimination. But he doesn't give up. He stands up and punches my dad's lawyer in the face. And then he sicks a dog on my dad. My dad has to fight off a dog. Now, as I'm growing up in this beautiful town in, in New Jersey called Harrington Park, every time my dad told this story, the dog would get bigger. <laughs> Eventually he was like, son, I had to fight a pack of wolves to get you in this house. You better appreciate it. Well, I did appreciate it. And my parents raised me to know the struggles that had to happen for me to have the privileges that I enjoy. And I went off to Stanford University on a football scholarship, a high school All-American. I went, stayed, got my master's. I went overseas on a Rhodes scholarship, became uh, a studied in Oxford University. I came back to Yale Law School to get my law degree. And my dad was not impressed. He's like, boy, you got more degrees than the month of July, but you ain't hot. Life ain't about the degrees you get. It's about the service you give. And so I went out and tried to, tried to prove worthy into the world and serve others. I became a tenant's right advocate a lawyer for people who couldn't afford them, fighting against slumlords. I got elected to be a city council person in a black community, low-income neighborhood. I eventually became mayor of New Jersey's largest city, and then I got elected to the Senate, and the day I was getting sworn in, I saw John Lewis. And then I went to write my book. And so I called back and I found out where all these people were that helped my family move in. I wanted to write that a chapter about how my family had to fight this, these challenges. So I found the lawyer who organized everything, who helped my family get in. And he confirmed all the facts I needed, even how big the dog was. And, and then I asked him, why? Why would this white guy in the 1960s when people were afraid of blacks moving into neighborhoods, they were afraid of something called white flight, that all the whites would leave the neighborhood, that property values would go down. Why would he put his neck out for a black family coming from the South? And he says, well, I know the day I made the decision. And I go, you know the day you made the decision? And he goes, yeah, I know the day I made the decision. He goes, it was March 7th, 1965. And I was sitting at home on my couch. 
I just started a business. I was tired. I was working around the clock, struggling to make ends meet. And I sat down to watch a movie called Judgment at Nuremberg. You see, 1965 was a terrible time in America because we only had three channels back then. And you had to get up to change them. This is ancient history here. But this man sat down on his couch to watch the movie about the aftermath of the Holocaust. And on that day, March 7th, 1965, you already know the day already, they had breaking news and they moved away from the movie. They broke away from the movie to show this group of marchers on that bridge called the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And he watched John Lewis and these marchers be beaten on Bloody Sunday. And what he did at that moment was powerful. He didn't just watch history happen. He let it affect him. He wasn't just a spectator. He wasn't just a bystander. He was so moved by these civil rights activists, so moved by their courage and their nonviolence and their protest and their beating that he told me he got up from his couch and said, I've got to go to Alabama. And then he laughed at himself because he realized he couldn't afford a ticket, <laughs> couldn't even afford to close his business one day. And so he sat down and he said he thought for a while and then he decided to do what I think this country demands from all of us. He said, first, I am not gonna let my inability to do everything undermine my determination to do something. And then he stood up and he said, you know what? I'm gonna do the best I can with what I have where I am. As an old saying goes, you got to bloom where you're planted. And so he decided that he, after doing the calculation, that he could afford just one hour, just one hour a week of pro bono legal work. And he called around to see who might need help. And he found this African-American woman named Lee Porter. And she's like, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. I need some help because we got a problem with a racial real estate steering here. And can you help me figure out? And they worked together. They designed a sting operation years past 1965 to 66, 67. Finally, 1969, he says he gets this file, this family, a case file of a family struggling to move into the community. And he says to me, we, we fought, we got them into this house. And he goes, Corey, do you know the names on that case file? I go, sir, what were they? He goes, the two names, the family we helped. The two names were Carrie and Carolyn Booker, your parents. I am literally sitting before you all right now. I am a United States Senator. Because in 1965, years before I was born, on a bridge in Alabama, Black history, American history, people stood up for their country and were beaten down for its ideals. And even though they didn't succeed that day in making it to their destination, just by their act of courage, their heroism, that spirit literally leapt a thousand miles away and changed the heart of just one man on a couch in New Jersey, who then decided to do something for the cause of his country. And he would go on to change the destiny of my family and send me on a pathway to where I am today. Martin Luther King said it. We are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied together in a common garment of destiny. Black history is our history. What those heroes did in the past, it didn't end. We are still riding the ripples of hope that they put forth like waves, riding them forward. But the call of history is not for us to be free riders. The call of history is for us to make some waves ourselves, to be inspired by them, to continue to bend the arc of our history more towards justice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Booker. That was excellent. Uh, 
as always. And I'm sure that the, the chat is blowing up from our students and communities and how wonderful a job you uh, have done. And because we have a lot of uh, eager students who had questions for you, but we, we, we had to get it down to three because we know you have a, a busy schedule. So <laughs> we'll give you three quick questions. And we know you're, you're elected official, so we know y'all like to talk. So, <laughs> 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 so um, the first question is, uh, do you, from one of our students, uh, do you think the Second Amendment should be repealed? <laughs> not, a, <Yeah. laughs> not a loaded question at all, Senator. <laughs> not, not a loaded <laughs> question, did you say? Not a loaded not question. A lo <laughs> Let's get the dad jokes in right now. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, I think we have fully within our power the ability to end gun violence in America. And I don't think we need to repeal the Second Amendment to do it. I think we need to do the common sense things that should be done, like common sense universal background checks. Like, hey, if you need to be registered to drive a car anywhere in the United States of America, you should have a registration to buy a gun. In fact, I think you should, we let people uh, have to take driver's tests and everything to, to drive a car. I think we should have registration. In fact, states that have had registration saw dramatic drops in violent crime. We should have treatment for mental health. We have suicide rates that are unconscionable, that are anguishing to the heart. We should have a, a nation where we invest in communities. We know that there is a correlation between poverty and gun violence. And so there's a lot of things that we could do uh, to, to lower gun violence. So the short answer is no, but I do think that we should do the things we can do to protect human life because what's going on right now is unconscionable, the levels of violence we have and gun, gun deaths. We are, we are there have been more people that have died of gun violence in my lifetime than in every American war combined. That is so horrific of a statistic and, and we must do something about it. Great. <clears throat> Question two. I, I need a drink after that. Oh, no, no. <laughs> tea, tea. Are you gonna diet? Are you on a diet? Is that? Or, I, 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 I <laughs> am. Rosario, Rosario have you? On, she has you on a diet. She does. Rosario, uh, the, the the Jedi in the family, has me on a diet. I will tell you this. Uh, I have never. Do you know this, Will Dunbar? Trivia question on me. I have it, never I, drank. I've never drank alcohol in my life. Did you know that? I do know. I do know that. You know, I know that. <laughs> you and Mo and I know. I'm yeah. saying it. I'm saying it more to get a wow out of Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Drug and knowing that maybe he'll let me. Out of, maybe he'll let me out of detention. Right. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Uh, question number two. <laughs> number two. If you could give you your passed, uh, one piece of your Booker, you passed okay. question number one. And when we had uh, Attorney General Shapiro and Marshall Mitchell on three weeks ago. They were trying to avoid that question. So I, I seeded that question to them. So I'm glad one of our students brought it to you. I love it. I, you, you're pulling A-listers. You had Shapiro on? Like, and, gosh, and did, we did have, yes. You, like, you're putting like, like Ellen DeGeneres and Oprah to shame with the kind of guest star. Oh. That you're it's, it, well, we deserve it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so number two, if you could give your younger self one piece of advice, what would it be? Besides enjoy your Afro while you have it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, that is a great question. That is a phenomenal question. I know some of the best pieces of advice I was given when I was young um, that I, I felt like I followed pretty well. I mean, so much of life is about hard work, I have to say. And, and I... Um, I really, really benefited from that. Um, I'm trying to think of other, I just feel like I've had such a blessed life to have a lot of people come to me with wisdom and I was willing to always try um, to follow that wisdom. Um, 
the, you know, I, I'm a big believer that if you want the things in life that other people don't have, you need to do the things in life that other people don't do. And I had a lot of people that always encouraged me to dare to be different in the work ethic and in doing out to get outrageous results, you've got to put in outrageous efforts and just be outrageous. I would do things that, you know, other people just wouldn't do read more, but I maybe the best advice. I think it took me a while to learn this one about fear. Um, when I was in seventh grade, I had one of my life's most embarrassing moments where I was, um, I was running for president of my class. It's actually my first election ever. And I still remember the people I was running against, Andy uh, O'Grady, a great friend of mine who unfortunately died in 9-11, Chris Cheevers, another great friend of mine, Michael Coleman. It was, I don't know why, it was only four boys. I, I, um, <laughs> but I, I but, uh, and I, it was my turn to speak in front of the whole class and, and my biggest fear in life manifested itself. I was terrified about speaking in front of crowds. And I froze and I could not get a word out. I, and I was shaking in front of all, all my classmates, including the girl I had a crush on, which was particularly uh, uh, painful. And I think that I was lucky to have adults around me that saw something in me and knew I needed to conquer this fear. And I still remember the teachers that pushed me to go into the school play even though it was like like the the, the like the thing I was most terrified about, um, and so I guess the best thing I would do is say it, this lesson I learned, and eventually I got very comfortable speaking in front of people. But I guess the thing that maybe I would tell my I'd go back to tell that terrified uh, kid in seventh grade that the things you are afraid of, you shouldn't avoid. You should lean into. To, to try to face, to go towards your fear, because that's when you're gonna find your greatest fortune, uh, that your fears are, are roadmaps of where you should go. Uh, and you'll discover such extraordinary gifts if you face your fears. So excellent. Yeah, follow up here, Senator, and since I'm the head of school, I think you have to answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I have to do anything you can tell me to do, man. So, you're, you're the head of school. <laughs> quickly, um, and I, I love that answer because it's so often in today's world, you know, we, we, we go to where we're comfortable. We go to conversations where we're comfortable. We go to restaurants where we're comfortable and we don't go towards things that make us uncomfortable. So in the next, in the medium term in the Senate, what is something you fear that you're going to go forward towards? Oh, I love that question. I really, really love that question. So um, I, I uh, when, my, when one of my staffers came to me and said I should go on the agricultural committee, um, I was like, why? <laughs> you know, I, and, and he and I began reading a lot more about uh, food policy in America and um, realized that broken food policy in America is at the center of all these issues we really care about, like climate change, environmental injustice, workers' rights, um, the disappearance of, of the family farm, um, health and nutrition and well-being. I mean, we just, the more we looked and studied, the more we saw this behemoth of a crisis that you know, Al Gore had his inconvenient truth. This is like the invisible truth. Like nobody realizes that every day with our forks, we are participating in a system of such profound injustice. And we knew that we would be the skunk at the party by getting on this committee and um, getting backlash. Uh, it's, it's one of the strongest lobbies in Washington is big food. And uh, they have a lot of influence on both sides of the aisle. And so we're about to take on a very big fight. Um, and I just got the chairmanship the, of a subcommittee that's about nutrition. <laughs> and, uh, and there are sacred cows there. Like, why is it that we as a country subsidize everything that another part of government tells us to get that gets us sick 
Only 2% of our subsidies go to the things that our government tells us we should eat the majority of. Fruits and vegetables get only 2% of our subsidies. The rest go to these massive monocrops that are used for all the sugar and processed foods that we that are making us sick. So I, I wouldn't say I'm, I, I'm, I'm afraid. I, I, I am more just really sobered about what it's gonna take to make change in an area where most people glorify the, 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 the food disaster that we have. When I go on my Instagram, I've been one of those people that loves to post pictures of uh, a bacchanal of food, when in reality, a $1 Happy Meal is a great example of the injustice of our country, that there is so much government tax dollars that go into that Happy Meal. And then we have to subsidize on the other side, the incredible healthcare costs. There's a great black activist named Ron Finley. You should look, he's got a the TED talk that's been viewed millions of times. They call him the gorilla gardener because he would just take over land and plant vegetables. And, and, and he has a saying that in South Central, we have drive-bys and drive-throughs and the drive-throughs are killing so many more people than the drive-bys. The number one killers in this country, uh, as one other activist calls it, the slow genocide of, 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 of many Americans, is, uh, is the things that are at the end of our fork, that our government has subsidized, our, uh, that target low-income communities, that target African-American communities, uh, communities of color, and the government money and footprint is all over it. Um, as these uh, big multinational corporations are profiting off of our health misery. And, and unfortunately, we, you know, we export a lot of things to the world culturally. And this is one of the things we've exported culturally. And, and it, 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 well, well you, probably, you probably saw, the first time I realized that, the truth you just spoke um, was in a movie called uh, Forks Over Knives. And they did uh, it's a, the China study, which is this longitudinal study in China of provinces that were not eating the, the standard American diet, otherwise known as SAD. And they had no rates of breast cancers, testicular cancers, prostate, no, like none of the diseases that are common epidemic levels in, in America, like type 2 diabetes. But then as they are slowly shifting to an American diet, and we're exporting now KFC, all these fast food joints, you just see places go from none of these things to spiking up. And so the planet Earth, from the environmental standpoint, cannot, the, the, we kill about 10 billion animals a year here in America. And we, it is unsustainable from an environmental perspective. So that's one way it's unsustainable. And then the other reason it's unsustainable, uh, so it's unsustainable to our climate, our rivers, our lakes are being polluted. The biggest dead zone, one of the biggest dead zones in the world is just all the runoff of the feces of animals. It ends up in the Gulf of Mexico that's just killing everything. So the ecological disaster, but the other part of the disaster is the global health costs of diabetes and heart disease. It, 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 there's no way we as a, a human species can keep up with the cost curves even in our own country, the Medicaid, Medicare costs of chronic disease is just going to be impossible. So we are headed towards an ecological health uh, a disaster, and we're seeing it in our children. As the military now says, uh, that we have these large percentages of American children that couldn't even qualify for the military because, the, the, because chronic uh, obesity and diabetes is so out of control for our children. Uh, and, and we are, we have to do something about it. So I am very sober that I'm going to be the skunk at the party and trying to tell truths that you seem to already know. Uh, but I'm glad that we're in this trench together. And I hope that you'll come down to Washington and uh, protect me. So the, the <laughs> tweet, we will. tweet of the night then is that Senator Booker's taking on big sugar. That's what I heard. Yes, uh, no, it's, it's, it's big sugar is, did you, I mean, just, just I mean, to say things to people like the SNAP payments, Pepsi and Coke make, I'm not exaggerating the number, billions of dollars uh, uh, yeah. because we subsidize 
uh, um, uh, 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 the, the purchase of, of, of destructive calories. And there's, that's a huge controversial issue, um, the way we subsidize sugar, but, but it literally is killing us. And it's especially killing low-income Americans who so much of this food is targeted towards. And now that you go on these websites like Nickelodeon's platform and you see these sh sugar being pitched to our kids from the youngest of ages, um, it's, it's so, so the short answer is, yeah, we've got to take on that challenge or else we'll never get out of this trap. Thank you for honestly answering my question, Senator. Will, what, you have your third and, question. And the, the, the last and final question is something that I know you're passionate about that my, my three boys, particularly my two high school ones, would kill me if you didn't answer this question. Uh, do you think college athletes should be paid? Now, this is a, this is a loud ball question because I already know your legislation pretty super yeah. well. On this. You and I have had tons of conversation on this, but for our communities, <laughs> do you think yeah. college athletes, because we have a lot of athletes that are at SBA, uh, so, so they're uh -huh. eager to hear. For all the teachers that are on here, I just want you to know, I got into Stanford because of a 4.0 and a 1600. Uh, 4.0 yards per carry, 1600 receiving yards, my senior year in high school. <laughs> I was a, a, a high school all hey, football player. Faye is upstairs cracking up at your answer. She loves that answer every time you give it. <laughs> <laughs> it's my go-to dad joke. Um, yeah. And uh, um, so I, played uh, football at Stanford and we played everybody from USC to Notre Dame. So the best years of my life, but I was astonished at the exploitation of a lot of these athletes that I would witness where they would drive millions of dollars in revenue. Um, the NCAA is a $15 billion um, a business enterprise where you have these revenue generating sports like men and women's basketball, football, um, uh, where uh, you would see literally guys on the field doing the work and people in million dollar luxury boxes just watching as their salaries grow. And the majority of our states in America, then the highest paid government employee is the coach of the football or basketball team. And I would watch these folks in their peak earning years um, have to struggle to just even get their parents out to watch a game. And, and the jersey being sold with their name on it was more money than their parents would make in a day of work, uh, cost more money than a day of work. And so there, there, there has to be reform here when you have like Shabazz Napier, after the final four, he admitted going to bed hungry many nights because he had no money for food. And so I believe that in the revenue sharing sports that make a profit, there should be a profit sharing formula and I believe that the name, image, and likeness um, that, uh, you know, you've had situations where you would have like Madden college football, where they were making profits using the name and image of people, or again, that jersey being sold with your name on it, you get nothing from. So I think there should be some uh, uh, arrangements to be made so people could profit off of their name, image, and likeness. And I want you to know I'm the leader in the Senate of this bill called the College Athletes Bill of Rights. That includes other things because you know there are no enforceable concussion standards still in the NCAA. Uh, you don't have a right to get a degree, um, even if it takes you longer than your scholarship, your football playing days to get it. Uh, you could be my age, a middle-aged, out of shape, bald um, guy, and you could be still having to pay out of pocket for injuries that you sustained when you were on the football field. I have lots of friends with you know, knee injuries or spinal injuries, and you're now paying the medical costs, not the university, when you injured yourself making millions of dollars from the university. So we put together a college bill of rights that includes a revenue sharing component and, and, and opportunities for name, image, and likeness. So I'm leading that bill, and I've got some hearings coming up. Thank you, Great. Senator. A absolutely. Thank you Dr. for joining us all tonight to learn our history, understand our history, and then take things from our history and shape them into the fears that we want to face and, and, and grow from. And take on Big Sugar, and, I, and you did not say you know, the Second Amendment. And uh, 
those are great takeaways for us, Senator. And, you know, thank you for giving up an hour of your time. The impact will be far and wide. And we look forward, I hope, to welcome you on campus someday to be able to walk around and see our wonderful student body and engage with them face to face. Um, I would really love that. I would especially love to visit the art classes because that picture you painted behind you uh, is, is brilliant, unless a student. <laughs> Um, and everyone in the community knows that the white, the talent and in artist and everything else in my family is from my wife, not from me. So, um, <laughs> our art classes and you, we, you, the clay pots that are thrown and the paintings that are done and the woodworking is extravagant. And I think it goes back to kids learning to use their hands. Amen. Just as you talked about. And they're already in a chat. And they're already in a chat talking about Booker 2028. <laughs> <laughs> If we know where our food comes from, and we, you know, those are those are really important things that we try to bring home to our students every day. And Senator, good luck with everything. Good luck facing your fears. We will continue to do that with, here at SCH for you and for our country and for a better world. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful uh, for what you all are doing with uh, in, in educating such extraordinary young people. I just am so excited to see what the next generation of your graduates are going to do in this in this world, making us safer, stronger and, uh, and uh, ending uh, the, the domination of big sugar. Thank you, Senator. All right, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thanks Corey. Wingard okay. says you were the better football player. <laughs> yeah, Jason Wing Wingard. <laughs> All right, we'll catch up soon. Thank you, Will. Right. Thank you, SC, right. for coming out tonight strong. I hope you all found that as inspiring as I did. Um, the history of Selma Bridge is something we should all know and understand. And I think we all need to remember to, as a, you've all heard me speak about the importance of understanding and knowing our history. And as the Senator said, to continue the bending of the arc towards justice and a better humanity. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Parent Association. Have a great night. Good night. Thank I'll you. Get, I'll get early looking at the roads. <laughs>